I'm going to be presenting my top 30 new details from the Avatar Legends role-playing game. I've been wanting to do some sort of a video that sort of sums up a lot of the information that's important from the RPG, and I think this is probably the best way to do that. So just before we jump into that, number 30, uh, I will mention that I do have YouTube channel membership enabled on the channel. So if you want to help support the channel, you can click the join button or there's a link in the description. And there are two tiers available where you can get access to perks like loyalty badges, custom emojis, and uh, at the higher tier, uh, exclusive videos. Uh, so you can do that if you want to help support the channel. First up, though, we need to talk about where all this information is coming from. And it basically all comes from these two books, the Avatar Legends core book and the Avatar Legends Wanshi Tong Adventure Guide. One of them does come from the Quick Start Guide, which came out a couple of months before the game came out as like a preview, but basically everything comes from these two books. Final notes, there's no real order to this list of 30. It is sort of just a selection of things from the book that I feel are among the most interesting. There's maybe a slight order towards the very top of the list at like the number one, two, three type thing. But otherwise, I've just spread it around so that the information kind of is somewhat interesting consistently as you go through the list of 30. Feel free to mention in the comments other interesting pieces of information in the comments. Uh, and then if you do want more in-depth discussions on the information in these books, I do have a series of videos linked in the description where I do just that. I did cover these books quite heavily when they first came out and I went really, really in-depth if you do want that. So yeah, with that out of the way, let's jump in with number 30. At number 30, I want to highlight the new art that is present in the book. There is not a lot of new art that specifically relates to the new information. It's more just that they have new art of a lot of the main cast. It is the situation where a lot of the main characters in the franchise don't get a lot of new information. So uh, it's quite interesting the way that works. But there's new art in terms of NPC legends, uh, new start of chapter art throughout the books, and new playbook art, which is the character archetypes for your create your own character. So uh, jumping in here just with a few of these, uh, we have uh, Rangi. It's our, obviously our first time seeing Rangi done in the like official show art style. And um, so that was really, really cool to see. People really freaked out about this. Similarly, we get like a cool image of Kyoshi. We get to see some of the ATLA cast in their comic designs from like Imbalance. So that's very fun to see. Uh, the, the chapter start art uh, is really, really cool. I love the way it works. You know, I use the Roku image in the thumbnail. Um, but again, there's another really nice Kyoshi in here. There's a nice Iroh. It really is really strong art. And it makes you wish that maybe they'd done some of this to introduce visually some of the new characters instead of it just being a piece of text. But um, what we did get is still really, really strong. And then let's not forget that the uh, playbook art is also quite nice, even though the characters that they depict are not really canon. They're just like example characters, but some of those designs people really, really do like. Um, so that's number 30, and we move on to number 29, which is pretty much one of the last visual things from the book, and that is the map, which does reveal some new locations. So you can see the legend here as well as the map. Um, most people will be very familiar with all of these uh, locations, but there's a few interesting ones like Chen Bao, which is a kind of Roku era location. Uh, Harry Bulkan is the name of the Fire Nation capital. Wolf Cove is the name of the Southern Water Tribe capital. There is a place right in the middle of the map at number 27, Water Tribe Sacred Island, which we'll talk about a little later on. Um, and there's also Natsuo Island, which is another island of significance in the Roku era. So again, the map could go a little bit more in depth. I maybe wish they'd separated it out by um, nation and just gone a bit more in depth because we do know a lot of locations and the book does cover a few other locations. It's just not very specific about where they are. So could have been better, but it's good what we do have. 
28. Wan Shi Tong is going to give humanity a second chance. So in the Wan Shi Tong Adventure Guide, we do get some new information about Wan Shi Tong. It's not much, but the most significant one piece of information is that in the Korra era, he is planning to give humanity a second chance. He's slightly changing his view on humans post Korra Book 2. He wasn't happy with how far Unalak wanted to go with his plan in the end, even though he supported him with it up to a certain point. But Korra obviously resolved that situation. And now it seems like humanity is trying to be a little bit more respectful of spirits going forward. And so it seems like because humanity are trying, he is going to try. Hopefully this means he will come into play in like future Korra comics uh, and speak on behalf of the spirits or, you know, promoting humanity a little bit more to other spirits. It will be very interesting. We need more spirits who can talk for sure as characters. Number 27. We learn the names of the other three members of the Council of Five. So we already knew about How and Sung. Uh, because we met them in episodes. But the other three members of the council, we never knew their names. We, we barely got a look at them. So we have Yi Wen, who is described as being taciturn. There's Ki Yu, who is described as being strict. And then there's Duan Mu, who is described as being fed up with Long Feng, suggesting, of course, that they were aware of his manipulation, but politically were unable to do anything to really stop him. It is unfortunate that we aren't really able to connect these three names to the three other characters, but it's nice that we at least have some more information on this group. Number 26. Hama at some stage gets transported back to the Southern Water Tribe. So one of the Ang era adventure hooks is the idea that you can maybe tell a story about transporting Hama from the Fire Nation prison back to the Southern Water Tribe. It's obviously very difficult to know what exactly canonically to do with like this idea of like you can maybe tell this story but they very heavily suggested with quite a bit of detail here that this is happening and this is what you should do and it makes sense because in the aftermath of the war we're having to deal with a lot of these complicated topics of um sort of punishment with regards to stuff that happened during the, during the war now that the war is over do we continue with that or kind of let it slip and so with Hama it's this situation where she committed crimes against the fire nation but she did it and was in that state to do that because the fire nation captured her and effectively tortured her with the way they kept her in prison so they turned her into this um, and they still want uh, punishment uh, for her because of that so they're, they're, they want to get her back but the, the, the restrictions are basically just that when she's taken back to the south she has to not ever leave the southern capital so they're sort of suggesting almost that the south don't have to imprison her if they don't want to so Obviously, with a character like Hama, the idea is that she's dangerous, but probably if you can safely do it, she probably should potentially be in like a, a mental institution or something like that. Uh, and there might be some hope of re rehabilitation, potentially. Um, so it's interesting. So uh, number 25 up next, the origin of the Yu Yan archers. So we, in the Roku era in the book, learn about this character named Uzuku Yu Yan, who is this legendary markswoman transforming archery into an art. And she's amazing at archery. But it says here, it's no mere physical act. It is spiritual. Perfect harmony between the archer and the arrow. And it's more than just... A violent act for her and the fire nation seemingly wants her to teach her skills to other people to share her talent but she sort of knows that the nation wants to use it for violence and so we know there's eventually a group called the UN archers who are amazingly accurate and a super elite unit so she obviously trains people at some point now whether she's forced to do that or is manipulated into doing it or they somehow discover the secrets of her ability it is sort of significant that they still name the unit after her 
but still cool that we got this um, for sure. Next, number 24, The Vanishing Act Adventure. So the adventures are sort of um, stories that are more or less written for you ahead of time in the game book. So there's very little setup work that you have to do to immediately jump in and do a story. So a lot of the characters' locations are already in place and you just make your characters and go. Um, this, there's, so it seems like this, these stories have canonical starts but they don't really tell you canonically how they end. That's up to you and it can go a few different ways. But I think they're all interesting enough that they're worth going through in this video. So the Vanishing Act takes place in Aang's era. While attending the Flying Koi Carnival in the middle ring of Ba Sing Se, Rose, daughter of Earth Kingdom diplomat Lei, goes missing. The suspects are numerous as the carnival workers are a gang of thieves in disguise. Rose herself has planned to run away with her girlfriend Hua. Hua won't be allowed to leave by the Paper Lantern gang that she's a part of, and there's a detective in town who may go to extremes to prove herself that may involve her orchestrating a kidnapping that she then solves herself. The player characters are helping Lei to find Rose. So, a uh, kidnapping plot, but the kidnapping could just be Rose running away herself. And, you know, we're in the middle ring of bossing say here. Um, I don't think it's the most interesting setup, but it's interesting enough because you've, you've got the carnival dynamic. And again, there's a lot of characters involved when you really dive into, because there's like, there's like 20 pages of information of setup for this story. So uh, there's only so much depth that can go into here on one point on this 30 list. But um, it, it's interesting enough. 23. We learn a little bit about how Eska and Desna are as leaders of the North. So we didn't learn too much about them as leaders in Korra. But what we learn here is that they're trying to modernize the Northern Water Tribe. They're trying to make more connections with the other nations. And in a way, oddly have the North catch up with the South, which is rather more connected to the other nations. The, the North is a little bit behind. It's a bit too traditional and not very modern. So they have to catch up now with younger leaders in Eska and Desna. It is significant and it will be good going forward that the water tribes will be unified since the leaders of both tribes are from the same family and the Avatar is involved in there as well. So, the North is beginning to evolve as the rest of the world is, and some traditions are beginning to fade away, including arranged marriages. Eska and Desna support this change, as well as the idea of more queer relationships coming into the open, as people in the Water Tribes are encouraged by seeing uh, Korra and Asami's relationship out in the open, and Eska and Desna obviously, like, uh, like I said, fully support this, and in fact, are known to appear at same-sex weddings. One of the adventure hooks is that they attend a celebrity same-sex wedding in the Water Tribe um, and, you know, something happens. So uh, that's that's kind of fun. And I like that. It's just, it's, it's a little bit of extra development on world leaders that we have in Korra, but they didn't get too much time. Very nice. 22. More details on Sozin introducing the hunting of dragons and the consequences of this. So there's two sections of the book that cover this. Um, the main thing, obviously, it covers the details that we already have about the title of Dragon, the rumours that it increases your firebending abilities and so on. But you get the idea that people like the Fire Sages and other people kind of disagree with this because it's morally wrong. Dragons are important animals to like Fire Nation history, to firebending itself. And we see that there's a spiritual aspect. The imbalance created by killing these magnificent creatures has already shown up in the natural world. Spirits are drawn to the locations where dragons are slain, and strange occurrences seem to haunt the area. Sozin has formed a task force to deal with these occurrences and keep them under wraps. And we see that the Water Tribe, who are investigating spiritual matters during this era, are drawn to these sites as well. And Sozin has taken to blaming the spiritual activity on the Water Tribe visits rather than the fact that they're visiting dragon death sites, effectively. So um, there's more dragon stuff to come in the video, but uh, for now, it's a nice extra nuance to something we already knew about before. 21. 
new details on the Air Nomad genocide. So again, two sides of this. We learn a little bit about the Air Nomads in the build-up to the attack coming and why they might have been particularly weak and not able to fight back as well as they maybe could have. And that is because they helped all around the world during the Roku era. And so they were very spread out. There were not a lot of nomads back at the temples. Meaning, and some people were aware of this, they become aware that if an all-out attack came, they would have trouble mustering enough strength in one place to stop the attackers. And then, as for how they executed the attack, we also learn that the Fire Nation attacked the other three nations with overwhelming force. And so... Effectively, it seems like all of the nations were attacked at the same time by the Fire Nation. This meant that when they targeted the kind of relatively weak air nomads because of what's on the other side of the page, the other nations were busy dealing with their own Fire Nation attacks that they weren't able to help the air nomads. That's a question everyone had been asking, and so it's nice that they address that here. So um, they also covered the idea that, of course, the uh, build-up of the technology for the Fire Nation assisted with how strong they were and so on. So really, really interesting stuff. Definitely still more to learn about the Air Nomad genocide, but this was a solid extra bit of information. 20. Details on Takukak and Sud, Roku's water and earthbending teachers. So, Takukak, of course, we saw him in the show, but we learned very little about him. We learned that he refused to train Roku initially until Roku proved himself to Takukak by living in the north for a few years. And I suppose showing that he wasn't just there to learn bending, he actually does care about learning about the different nations and being a good avatar. And so he earned Takukak's respect by doing this. Togokok's main role in the, in the tribe is as a diplomat for the Northern Water Tribe, though he also does covert missions for his tribe as well as for Roku. So he is sort of a spy for the Northern Water Tribe and also a spy for Roku, though he tries to keep it very under wrap that he does work for Roku in this way because he doesn't want to be seen as being sort of biased towards the Avatar or seen as being potentially working against his tribe. Uh, he is spiritual as well, and it's specifically stated he has studied and watched Twi and La to learn the secrets of waterbending from the uh, source, I suppose. So that's kind of an interesting thing to add to him. A true master waterbender here. With uh, Sud, we know that he's blunt and straightforward. That's his attitude. But interestingly, new thing here, he is brought in to train Earth King Jialun in advanced earthbending because he did such a great job at training Roku. So he actually gets to have quite a lot of, I suppose, one-on-one -on -one time with the king, who otherwise is quite secretive. So a kind of unique position for this character. He believes that the king is up to something, but his lack of political skill means he doesn't know what to do with the inf insider information that he has. So a very interesting dynamic that he's straightforward and to the point, but he actually has this this role as Jialun's teacher where he's getting insider information no one else is getting but he doesn't know what to do with it and obviously the idea is that the player characters are meant to find Sud and use that information properly but imagine he talks to Roku about this that there's some interesting actual story potential with Sud having this inside track. Next number 19 is the Earth and Root adventure. This is in the Kyoshi era. So in the lower ring of Bossing Se, the two children of Fire Nation Ambassador Quinn have been kidnapped by Dao Fei. Quinn has her own Fire Nation guards on search, uh, but the Earth Kingdom has sent out the anti-corruption task force out to search. Quinn does not trust them. Dao Fei are using the chaos to create havoc across Bossing Se. So Rangi brings in the player characters to try and resolve things peacefully. So you see the dynamic here of a lack of trust for the official police force effectively of the Earth Kingdom, even by a Fire Nation ambassador. So Rangi has to bring in the player hero characters to uh, try and fix things uh, because she and Kiyoshi can't really get involved in such political matters. So you can see again, it's a little bit more of a kind of, again, kidnapping plot again, but an actual kidnapping plot here. And it fits the Kiyoshi era with the whole Dao Fei dynamic as well. And again, 
there's like 20 pages of extra detailed information that cover some of the specific Daofei information, like someone's getting framed and they're actually ex Daofei. It's, it's pretty cool when you go into the, the details on it. 18. Pretty much the full reveal of the world leaders of the Roku era. So this is quite good. The Roku era is definitely the one where there's the most information. So of course, you already know. For the Fire Nation, it's Fire Lord Sozin. Not too much extra to add. But the book does really get across that he acts on pretty much everything. Any potential slight against him, thing that might get in his way, he does act to manipulate and stop it from happening. That's who this character is. With the Air Nomads, we learn about one of the elders, and that is Yudron, who's ba basically meant to be the contrast to the Guiding Wind leader, Kondro. The Air Nomads, we get across the idea that this is actually a little bit of a Fire Nation Air Nomad connection in that uh, young nobles in the Fire Nation are beginning to sort of take on a little bit of the Air Nomad teachings, and so the Air Nomads want to sort of make that official. But certain people in the Air Nomads, part of the Guiding Wind rebel group, don't like that the Air Nomads are sort of making political dealings with the Fire Nation nobility in particular, and it feels like they're going against their beliefs to focus more on, I suppose, the, the rich people in a way. Whereas the Guiding Wind are kind of like, okay, if you want to join our culture, then commit to it. Join our culture. Don't be a noble who happens to also do some air nomad-y things. Leave your life as a noble behind you. Get rid of all your wealth and titles. Commit to it and we'll fully accept you. And it's just those two kind of contrasts of like the elders of the air nomads want the positive relationship with the other nations but there it's maybe leaning more towards being too focused on the nobles and then the the guiding wind is being a little bit too maybe like strict about it so a, an interesting conflict here with the water tribes the northern water tribe chief is named skiri and uh, one of the southern water tribe chiefs is named quanit and there also seems to be another one of note in this era called tana so the main dynamic with the tribes is that they are actually unified overall in their efforts which makes the water tribe of the roku era quite strong and a force of the era the two tribes skiri and Kwanit, do disagree on the idea of how connected the tribe should be with the rest of the world skiri wants to be more isolationist and keep to themselves Kwanit does want more connections between the water tribe and the, the other nations. So that is kind of interesting to note there. With the Earth Kingdom, we get, of course, Earth King Jialun, but also the queen of Omashu during this era is Guo Zun. Not sure about the pronunciation on that, but she's an elderly uh, queen uh, and she hates Jialun. Jialun obviously is scheming and manipulative, solely to keep his own power he acts to stop people from taking him out of power and that seems to be the only way you can get him to do things um in any way the queen really wants to get one over on him find something true evidence that she can point to other people to say this guy is being terrible. And so you get a little bit of a dynamic where he actually tries to, I think, sabotage the delivery system in Omashu. And she seems to have found some evidence that he was responsible for it. And it might be something that she can get him with. So fun dynamic there in the Earth Kingdom. And it just overall highlights a very interesting political landscape here, uh, as we'll get through to with some of the other uh points in the future next up at 17 we have the night of silenced sages which is one of the things jialun does to maintain his power and that is to completely get rid of the earth sages already weakened from the kiyoshi era and what happened the poisoning and um, he gets rid of them to get rid of any sign of descent so you see, in a single night, Jialun sent out daily agents to round up every last sage. And basically the idea is that everyone who wanted to keep some sort of a job had to stay on his side. And they are now a grand lector. 
anyone who didn't agree with him disappeared, was taken out. So there are no known Earth Sages left in the Earth Kingdom. The Royal Learning Halls are heavily monitored by the Crown. And the Earth King has little organized, outspoken internal opposition. Along with that interesting point right there in the middle, um, the, the Earth King changed the constitution Kyoshi and the 46th Earth King drafted uh, to make changes for the better for the people. He has seemingly reversed those, so highlighting he's doing everything he can to keep, keep more power. 16. Water Tribe Sacred Island. So we open up the map again, right in the middle. Halfway between the Northern Tribe and the Southern Tribe, in the middle of the map, is Water Tribe Sacred Island. And it is it has spiritual and cultural significance to both the North and the South. And this is where any severe disputes were brought to to be resolved. And note it says there that the, uh, the chiefs make a voyage to this island at least once in their careers to pay respect to the land. But this is where Chief Tana comes in. And they found Fire Nation ships docked on the island. And again, we're in Roku era. So Sozin trying to grasp any resources, any land he can to make the Fire Nation as powerful as possible before he makes his big strike. So that's the key uh, kind of political stuff going on here also. But again, it speaks a little bit to the Fire Nation water tribe uh, political dynamic. 15. Some minor new Iroh information about his history. So, for the most part, it's nothing super substantial, but every little does help. So, we find out uh, Iroh's a decorated war general and was first in line to the throne. Okay, okay. Um, as a young man, he proved himself worthy to the dragon. So, straight away, okay, that, that means the whole, you know, proven worthy by the dragons happened quite early in his life. Um, but... Iroh lost his son during the Siege of Ba Sing Se. He left, travelled the world, then on that travel became a member of the White Lotus on this journey. Um, so that is quite interesting. It places that for us. I don't think we fully knew that before. Some people speculated that that might have been something that happened earlier in his life. But actually it's later. It's after the Luten event. And so it helps to just piece together his history a little bit better than we did have it before but nothing too substantial it is still a story that does need to be told then a little bit of loot 10 information when it comes to the siege of bossing say and um, fire army got to breach the outer wall through the agrarian zone Around this time, Iroh's son, Luten, was badly injured in the assault and soon succumbed to his wounds. So the new information is effectively just that we find out that it wasn't just that, oh, Luten died during the siege, it's that he got badly injured in the assault and eventually succumbed to his wounds. It, it's interesting that they specify that, highlighting that I suppose there was time between his injury and his death, time potentially for maybe some final words to his father. It just speaks to, again, the story of what happened around this time probably does need to be told in more detail. But anyway, number 14, Fire and Brimstone Adventure. So this one is set in the Roku era, and this story is about uh, the Fire Nation are hosting the Four Nations Summit and Technological Symposium in the capital with important people from all nations attending. As the summit is about to begin, the Fire Nation delegate, uh, Kuchte, announces that crates of rare meteorite metal have been stolen. Taukukak is there and brings in the player characters to solve the mystery before conflict breaks out between the nations. Every nation has a motive uh, to steal this metal. Tensions are rising and are beginning to turn a nearby spirit named Rust dark. So this one's quite cool when you go into the details, you find out that okay, the, the Air Nomad uh, person there is much more interested in the spirit than anything else. T one of Takukok's rivals is there and is, is out to kind of, you know, steal some information. There's some spying, counter-spying going on. The Earth Kingdom are, are up to no good, you know. Th there's, a, there's a lot going on in the background of this because of course, everyone wants the best technological information and even though they're here to share it with each other there's also that sense of like they also kind of want to steal it from each other as well so it's it's kind of interesting 
So a very cool setup for this that uh, I think comes together quite nicely. And this is why Taukukak is a legend NPC is because he is your sort of focus character for this story. Number 13 is about uh, Makituk, the spirit bender. So this is a very cool new character. Again, uh, this is a Roku era character. Um, and also one of our first uh, trans characters in all of Avatar. Um, but there's so much more to this character than just that because uh, we find out that she's a spirit bender and can actually calm down dark spirits um, and she protects this uh, edge of a large spirit forest um, and knows healing as well. So uh, very cool abilities here and then they also get across, you know, relation to her gender the idea that northern water tribe during this era so she was rejected um but she will teach and help others regardless of their gender so um she's not letting what happened to her affect how she handles other people so really interesting character uh, kind of proto unalok doing things kind of in the right way with some other dynamics going on quite quite interesting 12 ash and steel adventure so this one said in the hundred year war era a fire nation general named onomu has defected and wants asylum in bossing say in exchange for fire nation war plans the player characters need to keep her safe but there are so many obstacles in the way the rough rhinos are tasks with killing onomu as well as getting the plans back the uh, armadillo bear rebel group wants to capture her and unbeknownst to everyone long fang in bossing say wants the plans but does not care at all about onomu and realistically would be happier if she died along the way and could get and could also have the plans so he's effectively also doing what the rough rhinos are doing wanting her dead but i think the rough rhinos want to destroy the plans Long Feng wants to steal them. So uh, that's the dynamic here. It's actually quite cool. There's some interesting uh, location stuff along the way because I suppose you have to like escort this character across the Earth Kingdom to Bossing Say. And there's a cool kind of like fortress in, in, in the middle of the plains type thing. Um, so th this one's actually pretty, pretty, pretty nicely done. 11. Heavily teased Tagaka prison break of some sort. So there's two points where this is mentioned. In the Tagaka section, they mention, you know, now all that remains of the Fifth Nation is a handful of splinter fleets. Uh, and they may very well regroup and find a new leader if they can't rescue Tagaka from the prison beneath Lake Laogai. So it is noted that, you know, the rest of them would like to get Tagaka out if possible. And then uh, one of the adventure hooks talks about the idea of Tagaka is the only one who knows the location of all of the people that she's enslaved from her time as a pirate. So maybe the player characters uh, have to break her out to get this information to save these people. But it, it, they quite heavily seem to suggest that it is a major plot point that Tagaka is still a person of interest in the Kyoshi era. 10. The Air Nomad influence on the Fire Nation in Roku's era. So this is one of the key points related to something I was mentioning earlier on with regards to uh, the guiding wind and so on. So we learn about this thing, the Fire Nation, sorry, uh, the Fire and Air Center of Learning. It's this building that is being built in the Fire Nation because of the influence that Air Nomad teachings are having on the Fire Nation. More and more nobles are sort of taking these ideals on board and it's creating this partnership between the nations. And we can see the idea that the Guiding Wind believe that the corrupt nobles are leading the air nomads away and that this partnership is, is bad because of that. But then Sozin is also involved in this because he can't be happy that the air nomads are having such an influence on his people. And he eventually goes on to wipe the air nomads out. So it gives you a sense for his developing, I suppose, dislike, hatred of the air nomads that um, they're beginning to change his people's minds. So you can see he's trying to sort of seize off this building, stop the construction effectively from happening. But then with the guiding wind, you can see towards the bottom there, it's mentioned that... Um, 
Kadro Kandro is worried that there's a string of violent acts supposedly perpetrated by members of his order in the Fire Nation. That's not what they believe in. So it seems to be the case that Sozin has people acting like members of the Guiding Wind to make them look terrible. So Sozin's playing both sides here. He's trying to stop the actual center, and it seems like he's also trying to stop the Guiding win Wind while like acting like he's somewhere in the middle. Now, as we'll learn in one of the ones later on in the list, there's even more to this with Sozin and the the air nomads but um this is still quite an interesting dynamic of that the guiding wind are fine with people joining them you just have to go all in on it um so that's interesting but next nine is the air and wind adventure so this one's set in the Ang era. So Quan Yu, an archaeologist, has stolen an air nomad artifact from Sparrow Keat Air, which is a company that makes flying contraptions, uh, and has tasked the player characters with guiding her to Toph's Metal Bending Academy, while also avoiding Sparrow Keat Air from taking her back, taking her, you know, capturing her and getting the artifact. She wants the artifact to get to Ang since it is part of his culture. And the Sparkeet Air just want to sell it on, basically. Sparkeet have hired Yudao bounty hunters as well as a water tribe mercenary group called the Snow Rats to hunt down Quan Yu. So this one's quite fun because Sparkeet Air is actually a really cool concept. They sort of, I think, describe in the details on them that they assisted the Fire Nation with uh, development on like war balloons and airships. So they have a bit of a history with regards to why the Fire Nation were so effective at the end of the war. Um, their headquarters is actually like a giant flying airship headquarters, which is kind of cool and like a set piece action part of this story. Um, of course, Quan Yu is an earthbender and she did train for a little bit under Toph at the Metal Bending Academy. Um, they don't fully say if she can metal bend, but I think the implication is that she probably can do at least a little bit. The bounty hunter thing in Yu Dao is actually quite fun. There's a few very fun, kind of tropey style characters like the Claw. Two younger characters in like a trench coat acting as one uh, is also quite good. And then the Water Tribe mercenary group, they do establish that they can be easily swayed over to being on the opposite side. That they're probably more likely to actually help avoid Sparky there than they are the other way around. So that's uh, quite fun. And Toph is meant to be the sort of main focus character of this. Um, the idea is that like Aang is not meant to be really part of this story. And it's more that once you get the artifact to Toph, she'll get it to Aang eventually. So still, kind of cool. They, they're not super specific about what the artifact is. You can basically make it whatever you want. But I actually like a lot of this idea because it feels like a very building towards Korra era stuff, but we're in the Aang era, which is kind of cool. Eight, Earth Kingdom and Fire Nation feud over Natsuo Island. So Natsuo Island is right in between the Fire Nation and the Earth Kingdom. And it's also near Crescent Island. So Roku, in the, in the Roku era, he's obviously destroyed Crescent Island, which is affecting things in or around the area. Um, but the key to this place is that neither government has ever laid claim to this island. And now they all know that there's a large cache of ore on the island. And everyone knows Sozin is building up his army. So Jialun wants to stop Sozin from getting this. Um, but there's also the standoff because whoever invades first basically is going to look terrible and they always want to be the second one to come in and justifiably sort of take the land back and so you know some political stuff going on here this time between fire and earth um but obviously pre-war but just pre-war which is quite interesting and um, then we go into the forbidden scroll adventure so this is the one that's actually from the quick start guide um so this one may or may not be official anymore but i'm not sure uh, again hundred year war era it's actually set the day before ozai's coronation so the player characters are in prison after being caught trying to save an undoctored fire nation history scroll from the dragon bone catacombs they are released by fire sage nuan and given the scroll 
if they agree to get him out of the city. He now realizes how bad the Fire Nation is and wants no part of it. They are pursued by Fire Sage Bai and General Gong. Um, the group may need help from one of the various groups in the city to succeed. You have like, I think the, the fire finches and stuff like that. There's a gang in the city. They might be able to sneak you out in some way. And that's the, the dynamic that they're going for here. The people who control the city are the fire sage and the, the general who controls the police force. Can you evade them in time? Um, it's actually a, a pretty fun dynamic um, overall with you know regards to a fire sage trying to defect effectively and get away from things. Um, it's somewhat, it ends up being somewhat similar to the one of the previous stories again, but it's just unique enough, I think, to make it interesting. Next, number six. Gemsen, Rong, and the Singing Path. This is one of the most interesting, like, the amount of depth that is here in just a, a quick paragraph or two about this character and this spirit. So, Ernun from the Eastern Air Temple uh, left her position as a sought-after airbending teacher to protect the Singing Path after her sister died protecting it. Singing Path is just a spiritual site somewhere in the Earth Kingdom which is guarded by the spirit Rong and is now corrupted by a Daofei group called Ghost Tiger. So a lot of cool information there. New spirit, new Daofei group, new spiritual location, um, sister died protecting it, his emotional backstory. They're really going for it with this one. Ever since her sister's death at the hands of Ghost Tigers, Gemsan struggles with the urges to exact vengeance. It goes against the Air Nomad ethics. So she... You know, it's basically about does she, you know, kill in exchange for them having killed her sister? If they're making this spirit angry and the wrong is threatening to pull the home into the spirit world, is that something that they want to happen? Um, and there's always the potential that the spirit goes dark in the middle of this. Again, this is all there is on this. But I think there's a lot there in just two paragraphs that's super, super interesting. I'd love to see them come back to that. Number five, the Grand Tour of the Unity. So this one is about this uh, ship, the Unity, that effectively goes around during the Roku era, spreading the world, spreading the word of all the new advancements, learnings, uh, technology, and so on. It is funded by this business magnate named Teak. Not going to attempt to pronounce the full name, as you can see there. It's giant, and I'm not sure what, what, what they're going for there. But, um, interestingly, this seems like a great idea, spreading this information all across the world. All the governments uh, think it's a trick, and they're deploying spies to the place, and... Um, Maybe they're jealous of it. So you can see the tour is slowed by constant sabotage and bureaucratic roadblocks. And it's just that idea of it's trying to do the good thing and actually spread word because they're scholars, inventors, educators. But the governments are just like, there's no way you're doing this. Surely you're spreading misinformation. You're not just going to give us the information. So we'll just ignore your information and spy to get your actual information even though it's probably the same thing. So it's, it's a fun dynamic and I think a really good idea for a campaign. Next, number four, Chen Bao versus Northern Water Tribe, conflict over the Northern Passage. So again, one of those new places on the map, this time, Northern Water Tribe and a Northern Earth Kingdom state called Chen Bao, dispute over fishing and trade routes. So again, it's Earth Water Tribe, political conflict here but there's a cool thing in the middle here where a tsunami sweeps through Chen Bao and they're both blaming each other for it because a force of waterbenders can theoretically create a tidal wave that could do the same thing a force of earthbenders can create an underground earthquake that could cause the thing but actually it was just a natural disaster so in this case they actually one of the few times they say Roku gets involved to stop this going to war, along with the airbenders also being involved as peacekeepers. So this is really on the verge of potentially going to war. And again, it's not the Fire Nation this time, but it is actually uh, the Water Tribe in the Earth Kingdom here. So I like this as just a dispute elsewhere in the world. Um, 
And again, the other side of that covers the idea of like taxes seem quite heavily involved in the situation as well. Next up is number three, which is the water and mist adventure. And to me, this is probably the best adventure. It's the Korra era adventure. Uh, this one, the story itself is interesting, but it also includes a decent bit of backstory on Varric and the main sort of villain of this story. So it's a little bit more in depth here. So Varric has been kidnapped by San Ho, a mysterious businessman who seems poised to take over the water management rights in Republic City. He has a vendetta against Varric and the current manager of water treatment in the city, Wakanai, over something that happened in the past. San Ho is using his wealth as well as control of the Terra Triad to get his revenge by bribing and coercing his way into power. He has set up an explosion to happen at one of Wakanai's treatment centers. This will complete his revenge as Varric is being held in the same building. What did Varric do to prompt this kidnapping? And this is where we get the, the next slide here with Varric's backstory. So San Ho used to be known as Yinuo. He was an inventor and rival of Wakanai, but they eventually came to work together and create a new method of water desalination in Republic City, which would greatly improve the water systems in the growing city. The issue between the two was funding and investment, and they argued about how to go about it. This is where a young Varric comes in. Uh, Wakanai wants to work with Varric, but Yunuo does not. Varric wants the deal, so he tampers with Yunuo's experiments, causes an explosion, uh, and this obviously ruins Yunuo's reputation in the field, makes all his research feel like it's dangerous, uh, and this puts everything uh, on Wakanai and Varric. They can go ahead with the deal. He assists Wakanai in getting the funding needed as well as the deal to manage water treatment in the city, which obviously sets up the other stage of the story. And so the characters are involved in basically trying to get Varric back. So this one's quite interesting because Varric is the legend NPC of this story and he's kidnapped. Like something very significant happens to Varric in, in this one. So it's kind of weird that we, we canonically actually have no proper ending to this. Obviously, Varric doesn't die here. The idea is you're meant to save him in some way. But still, quite a bit of detail in this one, including us learning about this sort of like Varric rule that uh, Lin has in the city, which is that Varric needs to be lis uh, missing for quite a good bit of time more than anyone else before they actually go to search for him just because he's so weird and can go missing for long periods of time and just appear out of nowhere. Number two, details about how Zuko met Druk. So this one's a little random in that, like I we've talked about here, there's not actually that much new information about any of the really heavily established characters. So them randomly inserting this quite interesting fact about when Zuko found Druk feels a little bit out of place almost in the book with the way the other information goes. So there are only three dragons left in the world. Zuko's met them all. Ran and Cha from the Firebending Masters, but now Druk. They mention in his 20s he found a juvenile dragon he named Druk, who shared an ancestry with Ran and Shaw. Over the years, Druk grew up and became Zuko's loyal companion, and the two of them flew around the world together. Really interesting. And then he just covered the idea, okay, there are hunters out there for other animals, um, and maybe consider looking around for other dragons. So kind of teasing the idea that other dragons are probably out there, but it confirms Druk is a descendant of uh, Ran and Shaw in some way, uh, all this seemingly does is assume it kind of confirms, that, okay, like, I guess Zuko's not around with, like, baby Druk, like, hatching out of an egg, but Druk still could have hatched out of that quote-unquote dragon egg, uh, but they only met later on, but they still had, like, an intrinsic connection. Interesting that they sort of tell you the middle of the story, but not really like the start or end. It's 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 a cool piece of information though uh, that they did include here. And now number one, the reveal of Sozin's sister 
Princess Zaysan. So this is the piece of information that got everyone talking when the book first came out. Very significant character. We didn't even know um, Sozin had a sibling, let alone that his um, sister was so, so interesting and unique as a character. So you can see the, the one there, Princess Zaysan, a chi-blocking princess working to undo her family's corruption. And then in the red there, you can see that it's a conflict between the two of them. Zaysan follows Air Nomad philosophy and her goal is to dethrone her family, who she believes are evil to the core. Uh, and so she really is frustrating her brother here in all of this. And this is another reason why Sozin would dislike Air Nomad stuff for, in his mind, I suppose, taking over the mind of his sister. But also, Zaysan first started her training with Air Nomad's sister, Ryoshan. The two women fell in love. But she needs a political marriage to make best use of her position. So she kind of has to go for this marriage to Kandro, the leader of the, the Guiding Wind, over the actual true romance with Ryoshan. Um, so kind of a little bit of sacrifice she's making here. Um, but they all understand what needs to be done here because they view Sozin as a major threat. So um, they want to take down Fire Nation nobility. So Zaysan is more in line with the rebel Air Nomad group rather than the whole center of learning thing, like the the fad, uh, you know, air nomad uh, teaching stuff that some of the other nobles have. Because they do establish here that she has truly left her um, wealth and kind of privilege behind. She is truly taking on the, the being an air nomad uh, and, and following the teaching. So that's really really interesting overall it, it says there like in the middle uh, she wishes to renounce her titles and wealth in favor of a spiritual life so she hopes to get a powerful ally in um Kandro to you know make a big political move against her, her brother which is quite interesting um, and so yeah th there's a lot of um complicated dynamics going on here because Sozin is obviously trying to stop any sort of notable thing happening in the Fire Nation because he's building up to something big obviously and she knows that if she can get him angry he'll get sloppy and she can trick him and so on so some very very interesting things and she's hoping she can sort of I suppose oust him by ousting the entire sort of power structure at the top of the Fire Nation interesting especially because we we have no other mention of this character if she was super, super significant as history goes on, you'd think we probably would have found out about her later. So it, it speaks to the idea that something happens. And, and that's where the very end of the red text probably comes into play. But Sozin goes on to outlaw same-sex couples before the end of this era. So why does he do that? And clearly it's because of, I suppose, his reaction to his sister. Her both being... Air Nomad philosophy and um, same-sex relationships and that may be like informing some of her actions that might be why he grows to hate these things so much and uh, do what he does just interesting that they're adding is any nuance to it because it was a little bit of criticism with Turf Wars that they seemingly just randomly added that onto and Sozin did this but through Zaysan we're actually getting this interesting dynamic of like chi blocking a uh, fire princess who has air nomad teaching just really really interesting i hope we get a roku era story that features her as a character because i want to know her story and where it goes and potentially if there is a tragic end what what happens here because i think this is super super interesting but uh yeah that is basically it they're my top 30 uh, kind of details from the Avatar Legends role-playing game in the comments like I said at the start if there's something I didn't cover here let me know what you think is another one worth mentioning here on the list and then from my list which are some of your favorite uh, points from the Legends role-playing book what do you hope gets expanded on more as we go forward and get more content 
But uh, other than that, that has been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.